Right. All right. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to welcome everybody to another episode of the Book Marketing Success Podcast. Today, I'm featuring my great friend, Judith Bryles. She's the author of many books, including one about how to speak, and she's going to hold it up for you. Uh, ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> how to create a million dollar speech. That's, and, that's the banana uh, approach. <laughs> so I, I wanted to, now for those of you listening in audio, you didn't see her hold it up. That's why I read off the title. But um, I, so I want her to talk about speaking both as a tool for promoting mm -hmm. yourself as an author, but also, I don't know if you can, uh, Judith, but I think you can. Also, uh, speaking is a great way to create content as well. Well, it's it's uh, it is a dual-edged sword. I mean, there's there's so many things that you can do with speaking, and and the number one thing is you can sell a boatload of books. <laughs> and, and that's and, what we really want to listen to. Yeah, and that's what I call the cash cow two-step. It's your words and your mouth, and together they're dynamite. When you no, it goes, it goes back to John and the whole thing of marketing. Who are you writing for? Who are you reaching out to? So once you figure that out, the connection is already off and running. And when you can now bring the verbal side to it and the how-to or the storytelling or whatever it is that you as an author are writing about, it's the way to really connect and where people want to take you home with them and since they can't usually physically take you home with them your book would be the next best thing in most cases so and then again another way that it works i'm getting feedback again i'm not sure why but maybe it's not coming over the uh audio for you so anyway no nope. they can also take you home through the audio and videos that you create from yes. your speaking engagement, things like that, uh, podcast episodes you do, and so on and yes. so forth. I mean, I take you home every week. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> I, I think that it is an evolution. Um, and, I, and I actually started out as a speaker before I ever wrote anything. I, right. you know, I would do art. There was no such thing as blogging. Uh, there was an email. I mean, you and I are a little bit longer than the tooth and maybe some of our listeners. But that um, and I would do articles, you know, just articles. And then when my first book came out, which was going to be the one and only, no one told me that books bred by themselves, um, <laughs> that uh, it was people said, well, we want you to come and talk on your book. Um, and and it was really a while before I really got this is the way to move them because I have to confess for everyone I am a recovered, not recovering, recovered, New York publishing snob, and <laughs> I, I used to believe that only legitimate authors published via New York, and I did eighteen books with the big boys before I did uh, cross the bridge. Um, and it all became because of, voila, speaking. And I was speaking to a group in Seattle, and I got a call, and they said, Judith, you know, could, could you reach out to your publisher and ask if we could get maybe a little discount if we bought a few of your books? Well, I had just taken back the rights of the book. I'm now a publisher, I guess. Um, and I bought the remaining stock, which consisted of 60. And in my mathematical mind, you is less than 60. And I said, I'm sure I can make an arrangement. How about if I could get you like, you know, a third off? And they said, oh, that'd be so great. So tell them we'd like, you know, a thousand copies. Well, that was the giant gulp. <laughs> because, I, you know, I didn't have a thousand copies. And I actually needed to do a revamping of the book. And that's how I crossed the bridge. And once I did that and figured out how much faster and timely and, and how much, oh, my God, I can control it. And, oh, oh, I can make more money. I never looked back. Never looked back. Right. And it's really great, especially like in your case where you ended up having to uh, print more books, 
which a publisher would have taken weeks and weeks and possibly years to do. Well, and, yes, I, I had to do the rewrites of it, but I had to find a cover designer. I had to find a, a layout. For, I mean, I had to do all that. And, and I was really a dum-dum, truly a dum-dum. <laughs> I, I was totally ignorant. And um, but I was not committed to stay, stay stupido. And so I was going to figure out how to do this. And I did do that. And the only mistake I made in that process was um, I didn't know I, I knew nothing about this thing called manufacturing and printing. And I probably paid twice as much per book to do that. But I was able to negotiate enough books for that. I had a 2000 book first run for the new book. And um, and they wanted a thousand. They immediately came back and they wanted five hundred more. But you know, I, I was in the green. <laughs> I was in the green. It's one of the really neat things about speaking is that you can not only get uh, paid to speak, but mm -hmm. you can sell your book, and they will often buy copies for everybody in the audience or all the members of their association. Well, I we had the formula down. I mean, I was like a traveling store by the time this thing really got rolling. And <laughs> that we knew, depending upon the time of day, how many books we would sell. From the audience, the time of day, if I was opening in the middle, if I was the keynote or a workshop person, if I was the closing person. I mean, they could love you. You could rock the roof, but half of them were already gone because they just want to go home. And um, and and if you if you're evening speaker, rarely did you sell much in books because they may love you too, but you know I got to get home, and so you had that. Um, but I found that, and I always am very transparent on what my book sales and speaking fees are, and I and I did sell over a million books this way, copies of my various books. I did uh, gross in sales. Uh, over two million dollars, and I did make over three million more dollars in speaking fees. So, you know, I think people are nuts not to be speaking on their expertise. I, I agree with you on that. When I talk about ways to market your books, probably my mm -hmm. number one way is speaking. Number one. Number one. Uh, because you control it for the most part. Uh, mm -hmm. So you don't have to rely on the bookstores to sell your books or a catalog to pick up your book or TV uh, appearances or anything. You just start booking yourself as a speaker. Oh, and and when you sell them, you get paid on the spot and nobody returns it. You know, I think that's, you know, <laughs> an author's dream. Non-returnable is definitely an author's dream. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the, yes. you know, I remember selling my book uh, sometimes and uh, people would come up with cash and my book was nineteen ninety five, but they'd give me $20. I made five cents extra. <laughs> it's easy peasy. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, because you didn't make, you didn't make change. You just said, okay, I'll, I'll give you no. an autograph too. I'll throw that in. Yeah. No, we always rounded our, you know, our numbers. But the other thing I'll tell um, people at gigs, because you're there, you're there to sign your fabulous book. You're not discounting, sweetheart. Why should you discount? So my, my books were marked at 20 and $25. You know, I, I did have one. I, I actually have raised prices on books. I did have one book that went for 35 um, I had one book for 29. And then once you start having multiple books, you could put bundles together. Like we had a six pack, you know, get you to six pack. And, 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 and then it was like, they got a free book, you know, in it by the, the pricing, we would bring that down. And to, and, and literally, I missed that. Literally when we were we had a, we had a book table cause we were like a traveling store, but I would stack them, you know, like six of them. And I would, you know, stagger them. So they, people say, I'll just, I'll take, I'll, I'll take a six pack. Okay, <laughs> you're ready. <laughs> so. it, it makes a lot of difference. It really helps. It's, it's huge. So, I mean, so. everyone starts speaking and, and, and oh, 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 when you're working on another book or let's say, you, you know, maybe you don't have a book yet. Maybe you're in the, um, I'm a, an author in waiting. Sell your book anyway. I started pre-selling a book six months before I ever had it in hand. Six months. I was starting to collect money. 
<laughs> well, that's one of the things I really liked about self-publishing. When I first came out with 1,001 Ways to Market Your Books, it was called, it was called 101 Ways to Market Your Books. I actually pre-sold three books in, in a deal. And so I had to write them because I hadn't written any of them. Exactly. And exactly. uh, But I, I had to write them because I had a 1,000 people pay me up front uh, for the so. three-book deal. And that, and that pays for your whole print run. It pays for so much when you're ready to go. But, you, you know, you do have to use the money for what you're going to deliver to people. Um, right. and, and the only the only deal I did for the pre-sale group is I um, covered the shipping. I, I would I, I would eat the shipping costs. And then I would put when you but I sold it. We'll say the book was 25. We sold it for 25. Uh, but we charge six dollars for shipping and handling. So, you know, when you buy this, you're saving 25 percent. You get a 25 percent discount. And people go, oh, that's, that's really good. OK. You <laughs> <laughs> know what it was? Yeah. So can you tell us some of your inside secrets of how to book a speaking engagement and get mm. uh, and get the ones, especially the ones that buy a thousand copies? Well, yeah, and, and then I didn't know that they were going to buy a thousand copies. <laughs> um, it was it was the topic. You know, my my speeches have mostly been booked on a topic. And I had three distinct areas that I spoke in. One was from a financial background, which which I did have. Um, I had my own firm. I was E.F. Hutton's long ago um, token woman stockbroker. Um, coming along, and and that's how I started speaking, John. Someone someone said, "Hey, can would you come over and speak to a group of us in the East Bay and um, about there?" And I I said, "Yeah, I could." And I mean, as a speaker, I did so many things wrong from a presentation um, side of it, but I realized I knew a lot of stuff. And 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 once I figured out how to start doing the structure you know, and get it sequential, you know, it was hot. So I started only on the financial area. And then I went through an embezzlement many, many years ago from a, a female partner. And um, I, you know, we, we were homeless. We ended up homeless. I lost over a million dollars before, you know, we never had really had that in the investments. We just, it blew everything we had. And um, I went back to school to try to figure out how to save this thing because I had referred people to it and I was obligated, I felt, to try to save us. And I got into it. So I went back to school and, and earned my doctorate and my thesis was on ethics. And the topic was, do women undermine other women? What I didn't realize that that was going to be the ultimate lemonade stand. And that um, from that, it propelled, I mean, from media, uh, unbelievable, from the Wall Street Journal to the National Enquirer, unbelievable media magnet, but also threw me into groups and where, and this is now we're back to who are you writing for? John, I thought I was writing for the corporate woman, um, which is I was more in that arena. I wasn't writing for the corporate woman. I actually, um, at least the people who would buy my services, corporations were scared to death of me scared to death of me. Um, and, and, and I said, I don't get this. You do programs on, you know, um, sexual harassment and all this. This is a sexual harassment. It's just women undermining women. Men, men don't discriminate was one of my pitch lines. Contrary to popular belief, men don't discriminate. They, they will equally shaft anybody. Women, though, are more inclined to undermine their own gender. Well, that was like taboo. And, but my audience came and found me and it was called healthcare, a predominantly female dominated workplace that had toxicity woven through its uh, blood veins. And I stepped in to be, I came as a go-to person to, if you got a problem, get Bryles in there. And so that was the evolution that they came to me and they always wanted zapping conflict in the workplace or um, this, the, the title, the last title I wrote for them was called Stabotage, How to Deal with the Pitbull, Skunk, Snake, Scorpions and Slugs in the Healthcare Workplace. And anybody who worked in healthcare knew exactly who I was talking about. 
there. The book, it sold itself. It sold itself. So that was, that carried me for a long time. And then other things, you know, came along. And that now um, I've, I've transitioned because I've always helped people with books. You know, you, you oh, you, I'll introduce you to my agent. You know, sure, you should write a book. But, of course, you only should work with New York because I was a snob. Then. And, <laughs> and um, I'd always help people um, during that time. And then I had an accident. And I think that all of us. Um, have to look, you know, life throws some real curveballs. And I was speaking at a huge gig, 5,000 in attendance. And it was over and I was walking in the corridor, this fancy dancy Fairmont Hotel, marble floors um, in another country. And all of a sudden I'm on my butt as I have stepped in a gob of uh, either yogurt or vanilla ice cream. And I ended up with a brain injury. The work that I did... I could no longer do, you know, I, I didn't know if uh, I, I didn't know if I was going to be, able, we, we thought I might be wheelchair bound for a long time. And that in just doing the, the amount of monies we put into the, to my head to get it back was amazing, but I couldn't do the travel where I was sometimes in 10 and 12 States a month, John speaking right. on my books and I, I, my body couldn't do it anymore. And, um, but so I thought, you know, I'm the breadwinner here. How, how am I going to take care of my family and, and do all this? Well, I've always helped people with the books. And so I started doing these little mini groups um, when I was able to start speaking again, because my, you know, it took me a while to get my brain together. I lost my ability to do math. I used to be a math whiz came from the finance. I can I cannot do math anymore. I can't balance a checkbook. I can't. But the gift that came to me is when I'm talking to someone about their book, I see it. I see it. I see what how it's supposed to lay out. I see how it's supposed to structure. I see it. So that was the new gift that came to me. And and so um, it works well. Now, do I still speak when I'm asked to? Absolutely. I love to speak. I love to share. I, I love to talk about kick butt book marketing. Um, I, I love to try to inject the fun that marketing is instead of feeling like it is a freaking overwhelm all the time um, and it's like dirty. And the thing is that, you know, you've got a product. Your book is your product. You got to sell it, babe. <laughs> I think a lot of people when they're starting out, are afraid to speak. And I think there are a lot of authors that say, oh, uh, I don't want to do that. I, I would shake uh, in my boots and things like that. But in my own experience, if you've done it a few times, you know, the first time I had willies in my stomach and things like that, but then I started to really enjoy it. And I think that most people that start to speak and, and get used to it, actually start to enjoy it. I started mm -hmm. pushing people off the stage to get to speak. You I, know, I've seen they, you do that. <laughs> they take too long. <laughs> they take too long to introduce me. And, and oh, yeah. I'm going, I got to get going, you know. Yeah. And I think that, so even if you are right now going, oh, I could never speak, the reality is you probably can't. You know what? It, it, but people would rather actually die than speak. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, is, it is stunning. So but, but why do you want to speak? Because the public needs to hear you. You wrote this book. Now they need to hear you take it. Why should you speak? Because you're a problem solver. My, John, I've always said, it's not money that makes the world go around it. Problems. We authors are problem solvers. We're problem solvers. You meet amazing people. You go amazing places. You have fun. Um, and as I said, when we first started, I only was going to write one book because some well-known author, screenwriter, national, international columnist took some of my ideas when he met me and published them. And that was the epiphany. And the epiphany that came in is, JB, if you don't start taking some of your own ideas, other people will. And that's why, you know, it's so many of these authors get stuck with what I call one for the money, two for the show, three for the show, three, you know, three, three, and they never go. Well, speaking will get you going and you could start speaking. Everyone has some little tidbit of expertise. 
that they can do. And this is true actually for fiction writers as well. Absolutely. Fiction writers are glorious story writers, storytellers. So, I mean, I had, um, when I was, when I was, one of the things I did when I was speaking, you know, doing these workshops on the toxic workplace, I created scripts. I had like a movie script. I had, I had a big slide that would go up. Okay, it's time for the JV players. And, and I, beforehand, I had gone around in the audience with, you know, in 16 point font, by the way, written up so they could read what I'm doing it. And, um, and I had different scenes that I would have my audience um, act out um, on bad behavior, <laughs> you know, bad, bad behavior. And, and I, so I'd always ask, you know, and I'm looking for some volunteers when I'm, when I talk about this point, I need three people to read um, what's on this paper when I point to you. And, and so oftentimes I would get a whole table. I mean, these, these, and they were usually women, these women would get up, you could see them get their body <laughs> into motion, the attitude, because they were going to be a first rate bitch. Um, and it was great. And everyone got caught up, but it reinforced what was in my book. And this is what it said to people. I need her book. I, I need what she's showing us. I need this, this care fronting script that she's created that actually hospitals. Oh, that was, that was one of my products. I bookmarks. I didn't give away those bookmarks. I sold them for five bucks each. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it was because I called it a tool. And so I, the book, the Stabotage book sold for 29. I always asked, um, you know, would you like the tool that goes with it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I need that. You know, it cost me 25 cents out. And then I figured out, oh, wait a second. You know, I'm working with all these departments all over, the, you know, all these hospitals and stuff. So why don't I bundle them? I'll put a purple ribbon around them and sell them for $4 each if you buy 10. My John thought I was nutso. And the first weekend I sold 1500 and he says, all right, I'm, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> it's one of the things that you probably have to do when you're out there speaking is make sure you have enough product on your table that mm -hmm. people are not buying just one book, but they're buying a collection of tools that they can use. Uh, it might be audio as well, because a lot of people sure. are audio learners. Well, it's just like I said, we came in. I'm going to go back to, you know, I said, if, it, if, it, if I was a morning speaker, kickoff or a morning speaker, um, and then it was a conquest, and, and I'm going to say something about swooping too, but I always stayed. Um, if, if it was a two-day event, I was usually there. And, and, and part of my contract said that I had an educational table educational table um, and I don't want it at the back of the room that I'm speaking in unless um, I'm going to be there the whole time speaking the whole time I, I rather I wanted that education table actually I'd like a table right by the bathroom that would be a really good idea um, <laughs> by the registration <laughs> because people are going this way all the time um, and doing it. And I knew if I, if I spoke in the morning, I would sell twice as much. My record, my record in five hours, I sold 560 books. One book at a time. And that was a gross, everyone of $16,000 and some change. So, um, you got it. You'll get better for speaking. There is a structuring. And so let me come back to just saying something about the structure. For your nonfiction writer, this is the, the, the you authors. This is called a no-brainer. You have a chapter. Each chapter is a key point. All right. Each chapter will be a key point. Now, when you're structuring those key points, one, how are you, you know? I would I would when I teach people speaking, one, what what's her point? Two. How are you going to reinforce it? Is it going to be with an alarming statistic? Is it going to be with um, an awesome story? Um, how are you going to set it up? And then three, are you going to have an activity or an exercise within it? Sometimes you can do a live activity with them. 
Um, I've had people get up and change their clothes around. It's a hoot. Um, but, but, but when you do those kind of activities, you have to plan because when you have a large group, you got to settle them down again if they're, if they're moving um, on those kind of things. Um, so that you, you, so you have an activity to reinforce whatever it is. Um, you may have some cartoons you show, you, you know, you know, you may have some slides, but huge mistake, John, huge mistake. All these authors make is they put a gazillion words on a slide. No, no, one word. No, no, no. One or two words. You're you, you this you're the expert. Now you're going to speak off them because you know what? If you give them too much stuff, they're doing what they're reading, reading, reading. They don't hear you. They came to hear you. If you give them too much, you know, you do that. Now, here here's and then and so we go through that and then I repeat, repeat the key point, and then I go to the next. So depending upon how much time you have is what you're gonna fill each one of these module with. And then one of the tips I wanna tell all our listeners is and viewers is that don't get caught up with Q and A. Um, if, if I have been as a keynoter, well, you know, we wanna have a Q and A, oh my God, that's a kiss of death of your power when that happens. So if they insist on it, here's what I would do. I would know what my key points are gonna go through. Um, then what I would do is before I get to my final point or my final, um, my closing story, and I think it's always smart to have an opening and closing story. And for whatever my, my presentation was, I always had a story and they're my stories. They're what we call signature stories. They're not some goofball joke you heard, you know, two conferences ago. We've all been in those. We've all been in those. These are my stories. So if I had a big conference of women, oh, I always led with how my underwear fell off at a speech. Always lead with that. I humbled <laughs> myself. Um, we all laugh. Of course, it wasn't funny when it happened. But we all laugh. But I've connected with them. And I can't tell you how many people, women, have come up and said, you know, something like that happened to my mother or, you know, something, you know, like that. Anyway, so um, when I'm talking about conflict, I, I often would tell a story about how I ran into a butt of an elephant because I wasn't paying attention. And what I would liken it back is, you know, some of the people you have to work with are equivalent to running into the rear end of an elephant. Hey, okay? points made, move on. Um, or I remember one time I was doing a financial talk. And there was just unbelievable um, financial crisis. I mean, uh, um, USA Today, the major headline of it was all about everything was going to hell in a high backslide. When I walked on the stage, after they introduced me, I just had the USA Today. I held it up and I walked from one end of the stage to the other, recentered myself. Today, this is what we're going to talk about. OK, so there's just different things you can do um, on that. But when you're in the Q&A thing, um, first of all, I would always say before I get started, several people have approached me and asked me this question. So I'm going to go ahead and just throw it out. And I and of course, have they asked me? Probably not. Doesn't matter. I'm giving them permission. You're giving them permission to um, speak up because I've been, John, you've been out there. There are so many people with the same question. They're just waiting for someone else to ask it so they don't have to ask it. Is that not right? Right. right. It's always like that. So go ahead and open it up. And then, you know, you know, they'll ask a few questions and a final question, and then get back to your final point. And I would always say, before I get to my final point, I want to open up and, and answer any questions that y'all might have. Something like that. Um, and then you go in and when you take it back, you're now back in control and it's yours. It's not diffused. So it's, you know, it's kind of like an Oreo cookie. You know, you got all this filling, you know, that's been chewed out and then you can come back and do the sandwich. Um, it, it's you know, got to be a, a lot easier to sell when you're in control of the pace of, of, of what you're telling the story and all that. And certainly questions uh, really interfere with that rhythm. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah. so that's why you always uh, go back to make that one final point. So you're back in control. Exactly. And you can start to, you know, go through whatever pitch you have. But also the main points that you want people to walk away with, uh, if you don't reiterate them at the end, that might be all lost in the questions and answers. And the questions are often, well, sometimes, at least sometimes, very weird. serious questions, weird, yeah. off base, too personal, whatever. Or sometimes they're not even a question. You keep waiting. And um, <laughs> and the question is, um, there, there, and there's there's a, a couple of, of, of tricks you can do. So let's say you've got your book. Um, I, I never pitched. I never directly pitched from the platform. But the one thing I did in my introduction, and all of you, you want to have a written introduction that you give because, um, and, and you make that like in 16 point font, double space it. Um, and, and if you have an unusual name, um, you know, parentheses so they can pronounce it. Because a lot of times the person you've been interacting may not be the person who's introduced you. They don't even know who in the hell you are. Um, so I would, I would put your picture like today, the way you look on there so they can connect you with what they're supposed to be doing. Just saying. Um, but I always had, um, one of my things I always did for any group I spoke for is I always gave back 10% of my, my book sales. Um, and I, I'd always ask, you know, is there a special scholarship or something you're working on? Cause I'd like to donate back, um, for that. And, and that, and I said, you might, if, if we do, you might say to the group to make sure that they come back and see me at my book table. And this is now I'm going to come back to swooping my book table because Judith will be here all day to answer any questions you have. And you can pick up her book because she's donating monies back to our scholarship fund. I'm telling you, I don't have to say go buy my damn book. Um, right. They've taken care of it. Now, here's another little trick you can do from the stage. You know, a lot. No, no, I expect you to be doing this next week. OK, so. <laughs> Um, that if you if you want to make a point, let's say part of your presentation is is um, and maybe part of a story that you want to relate. Now, you've said this story so many times, you know it inside and out, right? It could be your own story, but it could be someone else's. In my book, The Confidence Factor, I always told um, uh, one of my points is about, you know, you've got to delete negativity. People who are energy suckers, you've got to move them away. And I told a story about a woman I interviewed for that book. And she, she, she was one of the most memorable interviews I ever had. And the real story is she was driving home from work and stopped at a stoplight and she was shot. And the person who shot her blew out both her retinas. She couldn't see. And so she pulled to the side of the store and that, um, uh, you know, and, and the story goes, the, the story goes on. And, you know, I, and also let me just say this, when you're telling a story that is rough, painful, hard, you have got to give your audiences an escape because speaking is like a roller coaster. If you're ha up here and ha having a good time, and then all of a sudden you come to something that really is like a pitfall, you've got to bring them back up again. You can't leave them down. Don't leave them down. And my attitude about ending a speech is you can leave them laughing. You can leave them crying. You can leave them thinking. But you can't just leave them. And if you leave them too down without some poignant thing to pull them back. And Sharon had that poignant thing that allowed me to bring back. You know, I, you know, I, had, I had one laughter. I had to bring him up because I'm going through this horrendous stories of how she's stabbed, she's raped, all this stuff is going out. That, that, that I, I have to move it here. Um, and that she says, you know, Judith, I, she said, this is her words, I have everything basically that I need. I've got a refrigerator that when I open it, it tells me what the position of the food is in it. I've got a computer that I can use. I mean, my phone, I can, you know, the Braille, I can do all these different things. What I refuse to get is a um, scale that tells me how much I weigh. <laughs> so the audience is, okay, we're relieved. Okay, so now, but the thing to think about was, 
as the memorable thing is, she says, you know, she said, Judith, I, you know, I know more people who are totally sighted and yet are fully blind. And then I would ask my audience, could that be you? Okay, okay, now, now she's picking on us. All right, so, but when I'm doing the Sharon story, I would pick up the Confidence Factor book and I would open it, just open it up randomly, it didn't matter because I know the story. And I'm just saying, one of the most memorable stories is let me tell you about Sharon. And I go through her story and go through, and you know, and I turn the page, you play, I say, I got to have that book. I, I got to have that book. So subtle pitching works. Well, I, I remember before Chicken Soup for the Soul was first published, I heard uh, Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen speak at the Book Expo. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a year before the book came out. Mm -hmm. But they told one story from the book, and I had tears just raining down. You know, I was just bawling away. And I said, if there's one more story like that in the book, I have to buy it. Um, as it turned oh, out, you know, there's a lot. <laughs> there were a lot of good, uh, you know, cry worthy uh, stories in the book, and that's mm -hmm. why, you know, it took off. Um, you know, I get a free copy signed by them at Book Expo. I bring it home, and my wife says, I want to buy 10 copies for all my friends. <laughs> and suddenly, the free book became the most expensive book I ever got. <laughs> there you <laughs> because, go. Because I had to spend all that money to buy the books for, um, you know, my wife's friends. And that's one of the, I guess, sort of hidden things about speaking is that you don't know how far it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, as people share what you shared as you spoke, and then suddenly they're, you know, they're saying, you know, I, he told one story from his book and I, you know, I had to buy the book. And, and the other person listening to you says, gosh, maybe I have to buy the book too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, and, and again, it, it, tying back to what you mentioned about the fiction authors. So you're born storytellers. Um, you can, you, you can have people involved with you, but you can actually act out part of your story. Um, if you will learn one of the great things about speaking um, and John, you have heard audiobooks where sometimes the author is a reader and it's like Dick and Jane went up the hill and there was nothing to change their voice. And that as a speaker, because you're interacting and you're, you know, you're sharing stories, whether they're humorous or painful um, or questionable or fill in the blank, that you learn to alter your voice a little bit. And in, in speaking, that really becomes that art form um, to do that. And also, there are times when silence is golden. There are times to maintain silence. Now, it could be up here, oh, my God, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? <laughs> but they know that. I always find that when I'm going to make a really important point, I'll often pause mm -hmm. before I say it so that people have a chance to sort of settle down and then actually hear what I'm going to say, whatever mm -hmm. it is, you know. Uh, but I've done that on, on stage multiple times, and it it's not something artificial or something like that. It actually grows out of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I think another thing about speaking in general, I think uh, it's a good idea to record yourself and to hear what your voice sounds like, um, that my, my voice actually was a little bit higher than it is now. I went to, and it, was, it wasn't that, I mean, we've all heard people with high voices that will make you want to think of the blackboard in the screeching. Um, and I can't listen to it. I, I mean, I, I can't. And but I knew that for the male ear, that they don't hear the higher tones sometimes. So I actually went to I can't tell you how many hours I spent on my hands and knees panting like a dog to work my lungs uh, to change the diaphragm um, a little bit to drop just drop it down a little bit. One of the things when you are presenting, when you're nervous, 
especially for women, is your voice does go up. It does go up a couple of octaves. Also, it speeds up. So when John says um, the art of pausing is an art to use it um, in that area to make a key point, to bring it together. So don't be afraid of silence is what I wanted to say. And John, I also wanted to say something about swooping. It is a pet peeve of mine when speakers uh, come in and I, you know, I've done multiple events where I bring speakers in and they swoop in and they swoop out. And the real thing is that people want to talk to you and what you don't get. Uh, I, I was booked ahead for my speaking gigs a year to a year and a half. Because I hung out. I was available. I was accessible. They would go back and they would tell their bosses or their colleagues or maybe other associations they belong to. We really need to get her in there. Um, and I know that I, I had a guy call me one time and he wanted me to speak to a, a group and I turned him down. And he said, but, you know, but we loved you. You know, the people who left you. I said, you know, I get it. I loved them too. But you're asking me to speak to an all male group at nine o'clock at night. And I said, I'm the wrong fit for you. I'm the wrong fit. Um, at that time of night, you know, where you've been drinking and you'd probably rather be throwing rolls at each other, that that you need you need a humorous. I'm I, I speak with humor, but I am not a humorous. And so I think it's really important to understand where your fit is. And it's like for your books, who are you writing for? Who are you writing for? But then who, you know, who, who are you speaking for? And I found my prime market was um, a female dominated. Uh, so certainly I did a lot with the C-suite of executive. But, you know, if you're in the healthcare industry, if you work in healthcare, there is a they, they all have a dark sense of humor to survive. I mean, you have to in healthcare, and, and I'm quirky, so I was a fit for that. <laughs> in the, but you've got to know who you're going for in that process. I think if I worked in healthcare, I'd be making all kind of death jokes. It's just my weird sense of humor that yeah, helps well, me survive. Uh, uh, blood works. Blood, 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 blood jokes work. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Uh, it's good to drink a lot of blood when you need to. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. But it, but it wasn't a good idea to call for Dr. Kovaki on over the PA system. I mean, no. oh, yeah, that's not a horrible. good idea. But that's not a good idea. So, yeah. So uh, it's probably one of the reasons I don't work in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. It, 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 they, you know, healthcare people, they have a wonderful sense of humor when you get in. But, but you know, you're saying something. So who do you speak to? Who do you speak for? And I always tell people, you know, it's better to ask me who I don't speak for. You know, I don't speak usually for male dominated groups. I don't speak for lawyers. You know, as a lawyer, I, I had to spend so much time trying to, to verify my expertise. It's too much hard work. I don't speak for government. It was too hard to get paid on that. And there was just, there was a different motivation uh, factor. I don't speak for school teachers. They're rude and they speak while you're talking. So you, <laughs> you know, you've got it. You've got to figure you're out. You're talking oh, about my mama. Oh, I'm sorry. They do. They talk. It's amazing. So you, you have to find your, 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 your tribe and then you market to them. And you go to them. And right. I, only, I only I only had one thing that I used. I need to plug in because I'm going to lose my energy here. I only had one thing um, that I used for any kind of marketing um, besides people gave me their cards. I had a post. I, I, I use postcards for marketing um, and they would fill it out and, you know, tell me who to call. So I would turn it over to my assistant and then they'd follow up um, and do that. But I had in healthcare because that's where I ended up landing. You know, people thought I was an MD, by the way, because I knew the jargon. I knew it all. I subscribed to every nursing journal. 
Um, I because if this is where I'm going to play, I better understand what's going on and the, from the trends to the trauma to the problems. So that was part of you know my subscription services, and they're very expensive in healthcare. So with that, um, I you know I did a, a variety of things to be the fit, and I had this one book, and it was called the Blue Book, and it was the Healthcare Blue Book. And it was broken down by state and it was broken down by field. And if I booked a gig in um, Iowa City, let's say, number one, we would send out a postcard to everyone, every hospital within 200 miles of that, everyone. And there are times where I would spend an entire week in Iowa going across the straight, whether it was horizontal or vertical, that we could get to. Um, and because every time I went out for a gig, um, it is not the gig, it is not the speech that's the hard work. It's not the delivery. That's the fun part. It's the prep work. It's the travel. It's That's where the grueling side comes in. Every gig I did was usually three days. One to get there at least one day there and another day to come back um, in, in, in that area. If I could put together what we call the cluster gig, um, then I could travel in a certain area and we never did more than, um, we never wanted to be much more than 150 miles away from the point we had so we could get there in that time. And by then, I, you know, I never drove myself because driving is my stress point. So John, my John husband traveled with me and he became the bookstore dude. Um, and he handled all the books stored and I just got to sign books and be the star. And, and, and that's what you wanna do, you know? So you have those capabilities and John did that um, for year, many, 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 many years. I mean, he didn't, he couldn't comprehend like cash being thrown, you your $20 being thrown at you as, as, as you do it. Of course, that's not the way they do it. Everything is on credit card today or it's, it's you know, on the on the, the gadgets. But, you know, that we, we could come back easily with $1,000 in cash plus a gazillion checks plus, you know, we swipe the credit cards. So. It helps to have uh, somebody helping you. Mm -hmm when you're selling uh, that many books, especially mm -hmm. oh, um, when you oh, speak. Yeah. And there's just all kinds of things that you can do with getting sponsors. Um, next, next time any of you are at a conference and they have exhibitors, here is your homework. You're going to walk the exhibit hall. You see that is there an exhibitor there that might be a match for your expertise? to go with your book and the pitch would be, you know, that that they they could help underwrite you being a keynote speaker. I had that several times. Bristol Myers would throw $5,000 to, um, I was their spokesperson for three years for one of their products. And they would put in up to $5,000 for any one gig if, the demo, you know, if I had determined the demographics are were right um, for that. Now, the other thing is, especially if they were there, and this is what you could do with a sponsor, say, you know what, I'd love to come to your booth, be at your booth, let's have my books, you know, why don't you buy a bunch of books and give them away and they have to come to your booth to talk to you and they get a copy of my book. There's just all kinds of things you can do. That's a great That's idea. idea. Yeah, it works. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any uh, last minute thing you want to share with people about speaking, uh, the joys of it, the trauma of it, the uh, how to's of it, anything? Well, the, the how to's for nonfiction, I told you how to do your structure, you know, you do it. What you have to do is make sure that you've got a good speaking tab on your website. On that website, you better have a speaker one sheet on there that you, you could have a separate section pub subsection for meeting planners on there but they're looking for not um uh this is less is more john that 
Too many people have so many huge paragraphs of everything. They don't understand the power of a bullet point. And I'll never forget the time one of my friends who was a meeting planner looked things over here for me. And she said, you know, this all sounds great, but Judith, when I am looking for someone, I'm looking for a decision I can make in 10 seconds. 10 freaking seconds. So we took my paragraph that had my expertise in that, and it was just one sentence. And then speaking on bullet point, conflict resolution in the blah, 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 this, 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 this. And we to, and so when I'm looking, usually when I'm out on the prowl, I'm looking for someone who can fill a certain topic. And you need, yeah, you need to understand that, that meeting planners are looking on ruling out versus including in. They want to get, get, get to who is the right fit for them on that. So you need a speaking tab. You need um, introductions on it. You should have headshots on it. You should have um, shout outs from people that you have worked with. Um, and, and you should have a, a video. And one of the things is I, I personally, since I do do programs, I would never bring in a speaker that I had not personally seen or someone that I know closely well had personally seen because in this day of, of slick, click and tick that you can be the worst speaker in the world. And, but it, you know, in 90 minutes, you can probably find 60 seconds of clip, clip, clip that makes you look just fantastic. And <laughs> I'm just saying, I've seen it. That either I see an entire speech so I can see you unedited. That's what I want unedited um, on that. And, and, and how you handle that um, and those, those things. So you, you need some kind of a short speaker reel for that, for a pop, but you need a speaker tab. You need to have that one sheet on it. You need to have other information that would help them make decisions. You need shout outs from other places, mention places, get the logos of them and put them up because it's like a collage of media. So you can have a collage of whether it's Coca-Cola or the American Hospital Association or whatever it is, that just shows that you've been out and about. Um, and that all those things help. And the other thing is, please, please, please stop hiding behind voicemail and all their stuff. I have right at the very top of my website, let's chat, here's my phone number, call me now. And people are always shocked when I answer the phone. <laughs> now, um, the, the thing is, I may say, I'm meeting with someone right now. May I call you back? And I will. But the the other side of that is that, and, and the, or if it goes to a voicemail, it, you know, I'll, I'll go in and pick it up right away. Or they figure out, hmm, maybe I can text her. Okay. And if you're texting people, please leave your name. <laughs> yeah. I, I always uh, tell people that if you do have to leave a message, the message should begin with your name and your phone number. And then you can leave as long a message as you want. But if you leave your phone number at the end of a two minute message, yes. How many times am I going to have to re listen to that message to get your phone number? That's exactly right. And so usually I'll say, This is Judith Bryles. I'm at 303, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then it again and just say, I look forward to, to speaking with you. And I repeat it again. All right. So, one last tip as we leave, I'm going to tell you that one of the gold, you want to talk about the gold mine, it is this chapter in the book. And won't you have a gig? Send a contract. I spent over $1,000 with an attorney putting together my contract. I never, I don't care if it was a fee or free, they got a contract. If it was for free, I would put in what my regular speaking fee is, but for you, it's this um, on that, because I wanted them to know they got a deal. And I will also say as my add-on, if, 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 if I ran into problems with a group or a meeting planner, it was not the full fee ones. It was not. It was the ones that, you know, ranked it down because they got you for less. So, um, but I give you my entire contract. I break it up. I go through paragraph by paragraph and tell you exactly why it's in there. 
on that. And you have my permission to copy and use it. That's a great value, and you've subtly yes. sold your book, which is titled, what, what is yes. it titled again? How to Create a Million Dollar Speech. And actually, we are, um, uh, next month, I mean, it, I just did a revision of it, very few revisions, but um, there is, uh, we're going to now call it How to Create a Million Dollar Speech, and we've spelled out the word million. We've taken the one oh 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 and in speech. And we have put it up with, um, you know, this is this is uh, full color throughout. And we are we we've gone into just full black and white so we can do some things very quick um, in the POD market. on okay. that Because it's it's color is expensive throughout a book, everybody. <laughs> and, and if somebody wants to reach out to you because you're also a book shepherd. Um, yes. Where would they reach out to you? Would it be judithbryles.com or somewhere else? Okay, so I'll give you my website. It's thebookshepherd.com. Explore it. I've got a lot of stuff on there. Secondly, but if you put bryles.com, it goes to the book shepherd. If you put judithbryles.com, it goes to the book shepherd. Um, or, you know, you can call me, 303-885-2207. What was that number again? <laughs> three oh three eight eight five two two oh seven. My email is Judith at Bryles B R I L E S dot com. So and and make sure you put something um, in the subject line. You know, like you know, you met me through John John Kramer um, because you know I'm one of those. I think John does too. I get three to four hundred emails a day. So. You know, we have to look fast at a lot of them or when we're going through our junk mail, which I clear out, you know, several hundred every day that if I see Mr. John's name, you know, I will pull it out. Oh, now people will be able to spam you with my name. Oh, oh, oh fun. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you, Judith. Uh, as you. always, I enjoy uh doing podcasts and interviews with you, speaking at your events and so on. So, oh, one last thing. You do have an event coming up next uh, next week. Right. Uh, on the 7th, 8th, and 9th? Or... We, we, uh, April 7th, 8th, and 9th, right here in the beautiful city of Denver that, you know, we're not green at all yet, but it should, the weather will be decent. Um, and the, the seventh the afternoon is a wonderful writing, in-depth writing intensive workshop. On the eighth, which is Friday, John will be speaking and he's going to tell the master secrets of how to syndicate and so much more. Um, and we, we have a variety of topics um, that throughout throughout the day from, you know, video books to uh, adding color um, to to your storytelling um, to just it, just anything um, and I'm always I'm very marketing oriented you know John and I are kind of joined at the hip here and then on on uh, Saturday morning um, I have a seven o'clock session called fire posing sunrise marketing and <laughs> and I will fire hose ideas at you. <laughs> For an hour and a half, you get breakfast with it, and 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 then we have we have a master presenter who has taken the art of making slides to I'm, I've never seen anything quite like what Jacqueline does. It's sensational, and then we have some really structuring um, on the storytelling. So there's some humor fiction, lots for nonfiction, but it's all about author success. And that's the author you extravaganza. You can go to author you letter you dot org, click on the events tab, and, and this is when you need to call me and say if there's there's any room. Okay. Yep. Say oh oh when oh, Friday night. Oh my God, Nancy Norton is with us, who is a headline comedy works star. Um, who won the Seattle Best Comedy, the Boston Best Comedy. She is a hoot. And she's our dessert with dinner. 
So thank you very much. So that's authoru.org and then click on the event, event uh, tab and uh, you can find out about it. You can sign up for it and so on. Uh, so thanks a lot, Judith. I thank really you. enjoyed this. I love, again, uh, speaking with you, to kibitzing with you and all of that. So thank you very much. This is the way we speak together. We play, see? And if you <laughs> want to play, then it's not work. All right, everyone. Have a great week. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay.